Let's talk about what I read in May. Hello, my name is Emily Crow from The Cozy Crow and welcome to my YouTube channel. And today we have an exciting video. We're gonna be talking about everything that I read in the month of May. And I had a really big reading month and overall a really good reading month too. So I'm excited to share with you all the things that I was able to read. But first, statistics. So I read a total of 18 books in the month of May. I read three physical books, I read three ebooks, and that makes 12 audiobooks that I got through in the month. I do a lot of driving, I listen to audiobooks when I drive, I listen to audiobooks when I exercise, I listen to audiobooks when I do chores. So more often than not, audiobooks will be my top method of reading in the month. Let's take a look at a breakdown of which genres I read this month. My top genre this month was actually romance. I read eight books. Now I'm not going into any like fantasy romance or paranormal romance or other subgenres, just romance in general. I read eight of them, which is pretty amazing. And that's because of two videos that I filmed for my channel. I'll talk about those in a second. I read three mysteries or thrillers. I read four fantasy novels, and then I read one each of a nonfiction, a horror, and a speculative or literary fiction, which is a pretty accurate breakdown of the types of books I tend to read anyway. So this is not abnormal for me. It's just interesting to take a look at these statistics. I mentioned I filmed two videos that definitely impacted which books I read this month. And one of them was my book box for Yarnaceous Fibers. The premise of these book boxes that certain yarn dyers are making is that based off of a book that is either included or not within this package, you have yarn, you have goodies, both fiber related, but also not fiber related. And you read the book and get to open these packages and experience these goodies. In the most recent book box by Yarnaceous Fibers that was sent out in April, they did A Touch of Darkness by Scarlett St. Clair. And so I did a reading vlog where I opened this box, experienced the goodies, read the book, even knit the pattern with the yarn included in the box. So make sure to check out that video. I'll link it up above and down below. So I read a couple books because of that video. Yes, not just one, I read two books from that series in that video. And then I also decided to do a romance readathon because I have been in the mood for romance and I have a lot of romance books on my physical TBR. I wanted to get through as many as possible. So I did a 24 hour readathon. I timed myself reading, saw how much I read in 24 hours on my timer. And so I got through a few books because of that. And that video is probably coming out next week. So keep an eye out for that if you wanna get more in-depth detail about my experience doing this vlog readathon. I had a lot of fun, honestly. I think I'm gonna do it again probably pretty soon. Maybe a different genre or maybe I'll do another romance readathon. I don't know. It was honestly really fun. I also have one video that just came out that's actually my TBR for June. Again, like I said, I have a lot of books in my physical TBR. I want to try and get through them faster. So I am setting a goal for myself in the month of June to read as many books on my TBR as possible. I'm trying to curate my Libby loans right now so that they are all or mostly books that I already own and just haven't gotten to yet. Because like I said, I go through a lot of audiobooks. So I figured I can do audiobooks for books I have in my physical TBR and get through them faster than I can reading them physically. I'm also trying with my eBooks and of course my physical books to read books I have already in my TBR so that I can hopefully get a big stack of books out of my TBR closet and into my bookshelves. Well, next to my bookshelves because I don't have a lot of space. So make sure to check out that video to see the books I'm hoping to get to in the month of June. But today we're just gonna talk about the books that I read in May. Let's hop right into it. Here's the stack of all the physical books that I have that I got through this month, but this is not all the books that I read. Starting off, I read A Touch of Darkness by Scarlett St. Clair. I'm gonna just talk about this very briefly. I have my notes again. I feel like that worked really well with my last video. So I rated this a 3.75 star. I found this really fun, really easy, a really quick read considering the length of this book. It wasn't a literary book by any means, but it was a fun time. I really enjoyed myself. It definitely was more lusty and spicy than I prefer in my books, but if you like that, they have lots of spicy scenes in this book. I found that I just like, I didn't like Persephone 
too much. I really like the world building. A Touch of Darkness is a Hades and Persephone retelling that's set in a modern day world where there are Greek gods and goddesses amongst the mortals. They're the famous people that the paparazzi is trying to get pictures of, etc. And so it felt very familiar in a modern world, but also was very interesting and different because of this Greek influence and the fact that the Greek gods were on the earth and using their magic and things like that. So this was really intriguing to read, a really interesting world that I enjoyed immersing myself in. And I definitely see myself reading more books in this series. In this book though, I just, I wasn't a super fan of Persephone. I didn't really hate her, but there were some things she did that just were really bugging me. <laughs> she seemed to like create issues that weren't there and purposefully distrust Hades for no good reason and she would get good evidence to trust him and then she would just be like mm, no thanks i'm going to go off this other direction so it was just kind of weird i didn't really enjoy reading that part of her personality and i felt like she was again like overtly jealous for no good reason like clearly she didn't need to be jealous but for some reason she was overall i liked her as a character but I didn't really get her and I wasn't totally on board with her. So we'll see how she progresses and if she has some character growth throughout the books in the series. I definitely see myself reading more, like I said. The next book that I read was How to Solve Your Own Murder by Kristen Perrin. And this was a really interesting murder mystery, kind of a whodunit style. So there's a dual timeline here where the main character in the present day timeline has just been murdered. When she was a teenager, she received a fortune of how she would die. And so she had been obsessed with it since she was like 16. And that became like her whole life. And she ended up, yes, indeed, being murdered when she was old. And you follow her great niece, I think it's her great niece, who is set to inherit if she figures out who done it. And so you see from the present day perspective as this great niece is trying to figure out what's going on and you jump back in time to when the elderly lady is a teenager with her group of friends. There are secrets, there are lies, and you hear about how this person's friend went missing like 50 years ago or 60 years ago, which is really fascinating and how the two mysteries end up becoming linked. So this was a really interesting premise and I really like having the dual timelines and just the perspective it took. I rated this a four star. I did really enjoy my time. I felt like I really enjoyed both timelines and seeing it go back and forth and how they interacted with one another, the parallels we saw, the ways in which the main character in the present timeline was reading journal entries from her great aunt and was looking through those and learning things about the mystery that took place 50 or 60 years ago. So it was really interesting in that way. I did feel like though some of the dialogue and some of the things that the main character learned were a little bit stilted and like very intentional to just move the plot along. It wasn't as seamless of a mystery and like receiving clues as I would have liked. I also felt like there was just way too many characters, partly because there were two different timelines, but I felt like because the great niece didn't really know anyone in the small village, she was meeting all these people and it was hard to get a lot of depth in these characters and really understand what possible motives were. And so when the reveal happened, it felt like it made sense, but it also felt like I didn't have any information for that to make sense. In retrospect, there was just a lot of people and moving parts and it was hard to kind of distinguish what was going on. And it was kind of hard to keep track of as you were jumping between timelines and having all these people and a lot of them overlap between timelines, but it took a little while to kind of get used to who all the characters were and I feel like that detracted a little bit from the story but I definitely recommend this. It looks like this is part of a series. I'm really looking forward to seeing other books by this author. The next book that I finished I have a physical copy of. Pulling it down. This is Mama Kesses by Gwenna Laflin and she is a TikTok sensation. I didn't find her on TikTok. I found her on YouTube, but I really appreciated her refreshing and sometimes irreverent parenting style. It's been really fun watching her videos and learning from her perspective. And she wrote a parenting field guide. This isn't chock full of research or chock full of tips and tricks for what you can do to be, to be a better parent. 
but it shares some funny moments and some interesting thoughts from her experience as a parent. And I found myself really liking that I had a physical copy of the book so that as I was listening to this audiobook, I could stop it and open my book and underline a sentence or two. And so I didn't make a ton of notes, but every couple pages I underlined a sentence that really stood out to me and gave me some thoughts about how I want to be a more responsive parent. And so this was a nice, light read as far as like a parenting book goes. If you're looking for a lighthearted parenting book with some tips and tricks, but not overly full of like information that you have to study to like figure out how do you, how you want to apply it to your parenting, this is a great book for you. I love the little blurb on the front it says a field guide to responsive parenting and trying not to be the reason your kid needs therapy. I listened to the audiobook and Gwena herself read it. And so I really enjoyed that. I know some criticism has been in reading this book. It's just such a conversational and familiar tone that it's a little hard to read because there's a lot of instances of poor grammar and things because it's conversational. And so I feel like this book is much better as an audiobook than as a physical book. But I liked having the physical book so I could go back and reference the things that I wanted to underline and make note of for later. The next book that I read is A Game of Fates by Scarlett St. Clair. This is the second book in the Hades and Persephone saga, I think it's called. I was still knitting up the pattern for this book box when I finished the first book in the series. So I figured might as well get the Libby audiobook to the second book and continue because I had not had enough. I was just having so much fun and I wanted to continue to stay in this world because it just was such a fun and quick read. So I read the second book. This book is actually the events of the first book through Hades perspective. And I was a little nervous that things would feel repetitive. It definitely had a different tone. Hades is even more lusty than Persephone. I really enjoyed having a different perspective and seeing more plot come out and more information on like the world building because that's what I really enjoyed from the first book was learning about the world. And so I got more of that through Hades because he's a god and he's been around for like millennia basically. I did feel like this romance was less compelling and way hornier than the romance of the first book. Whereas the romance of the first book felt like it had more of a progression in Persephone's feelings for Hades. In this book, Hades was like, oh, well, we're fated to be together, so we're gonna be together. And that was like the extent of the depth in the romance. So I'm interested in reading the next book. I rated this one a 3.75 star, but I'm not in a hurry. After reading the second book, I felt satisfied and didn't feel the need to start the next book immediately, but I'm definitely gonna continue because this has been fun and I'm interested to see kind of how things continue to progress. The next book that I read, <laughs> was Queen of Shadows by Sarah J. Mass, and I learned it's Mass as in Massachusetts, not Moss as I had pronounced it. I apologize. <laughs> but Sarah J. Mass, Queen of Shadows, this was the first book that I did as an ebook from this Throne of Glass series. All the other books had audiobooks through my library. But starting with Queen of Shadows and all the longer books at the end of the series, you can only get the audiobook from Audible and I did not want to buy it. So ebook it was, and I really enjoyed it. Five star, loved it. I found that there were many cliffhangers throughout this book that made me want to keep reading. I loved the different perspectives and seeing the characters grow and learn and change, though I still really don't like Kale, but that's a me problem, I think. So <laughs> I really enjoyed this book. Lots happened in it. How can I even sum it up? I have been really enjoying Throne of Glass. The next book that I read in the month of May was actually my favorite book of the month. And this is The Measure by Nikki Ehrlich. And this is a speculative fiction about a time when everyone wakes up and finds a box with their name on it outside their door. And they open it up and find a string that is apparently the measure of their life. They don't know where the boxes came from or why they're there. You see society learning about these strings, wondering what's happening, researchers trying to figure out what they mean. And then as people understand that this is the measure of your life, like the length of your life, what that means for people individually and as a society. So it definitely was reminiscent of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was almost triggering to read because there were so many parallels with what I remember feeling in the midst of the pandemic. And so just be warned 
But it's so much more than like a retelling of the COVID-19 pandemic. It gives a lot to think about. What would you do if you were presented with this string? Would you look? Would you not look? Would you look at other people's strings? What would you do with your life if you knew how long your string was? What would you want to happen to other people if you knew how long their strings were? So it talked a lot about discrimination and prejudice and filling your life with meaningful things, no matter how long or short it was. And so that was just really fascinating. And it was very heartfelt. It definitely made me cry. It definitely made me feel a lot of things. If you're looking for a good cry, but with some hope thrown in there, I definitely recommend this book. And this is a debut novel, which is phenomenal. There were a lot of individual point of views of people experiencing this pandemic phenomenon and you see how their lives intersect and you see little Easter eggs of people mentioned previously. They come up later on in the story. So it's just woven together beautifully. The next book, I am on a roll now that I read in the month of May was Caraval by Stephanie Garber. This is the first book in a series. I don't know if this is her first book ever, but there are two different series that are really popular of hers. The Caraval series and the Once Upon a Broken Heart series. The Caraval series comes first and so I wanna read it first. I really enjoyed this book. I did the audiobook and it's definitely a YA, but you follow these two sisters who are trying to escape their abusive father and they go to this carnival. It's almost like a carnival, but it's magical, it's sinister, it's mysterious and whimsical at the same time. It's a very interesting atmosphere. These two sisters leave their abusive father, they run away basically, and attend this carnival to try to participate in the magical game. One sister goes missing and the other has to try to find her as part of the game. It's just really fascinating. I loved how vibey this was and that it really was different than I thought. I loved how it was more mysterious and sinister than anticipated. And there's definitely a little bit of like gory stuff mentioned and just wrapping your brain around what's happening. is just really fascinating. As a YA novel, I really enjoyed this. Now, it definitely had some flaws, but I still was sucked into this story and really enjoyed it. I rated it a 4.25 star. While I was writing my review, I was like, I love this book. It was so good. And I kept thinking of more things I found that were wrong with it, but I just still really enjoyed myself. And I'm really looking forward to reading the next book in the series. As far as things that I did not like, the very ending of this book was wild, but it involved a lot of like manipulation and it felt like the issues that were presented were forgiven really easily and that did not sit well with me. So I'm hoping that those come out more in the later books in the series. It isn't actually resolved because it was a huge deal. <laughs> So I really hope that later books address that more, but I really like the pacing of this. I like the atmosphere. I didn't really like the romance. I was feeling eh about the romance, but I'm here for everything else. Another book that I have a physical copy of. This one I actually read physically. I'm trying to grab this without knocking things over. This is The Lives of Saints by Lee Bardugo. It's a beautiful book. ASMR, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a beautiful texture on it. And in it, there's some beautiful artwork of different saints in the Grisha verse. Many, many saints that you have not heard about, but also saints that you have heard about if you've read through all the Grisha verse novels. And I really loved just reading a story or two at bedtime and just enjoying reading about it. I wish there was more depth in it. This felt very like abbreviated in like a fairy tale sense. I would have loved more depth, but they're very like Aesop's fables style of stories and you learn about these saints from different countries within this world in the Grishaverse. And at the very end of these little stories, you get like kind of like a little moral or like this saint is the saint of blah, 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 blah. So that was really fascinating and I really enjoyed it. Rated it a four star. If you like the Grishaverse, I think this is a beautiful book to have and to look through and it has some beautiful artwork, but you don't need it to enjoy the Grishaverse at all. I just wanted to read everything related to the Grish verse because I've really enjoyed my, the books by Lee Bardugo. Another four star, but this is an audiobook. I read Finlay Donovan, Rolls the Dice, and this is the fourth book 
in the Finley Donovan series. And even though when I read the first book, I wasn't sure if I would like it. I wasn't sure how much I would like it. I've read every single book since then and I'm just getting more used to the writing style and the ridiculousness of this mystery. I don't want to spoil because if you haven't read the prior books, you might not understand why this book is even happening. Basically, Finley and Vero are in Atlantic City looking for a friend that has been kidnapped. And I really like how this whole plot was ridiculous like the whole way through. Like I like the pacing of it and how there weren't some reasonable things and then some crazy ridiculous things happening. I felt like it was just ridiculous the whole way through. So you could just suspend your disbelief and have a lot of fun with it. And I really liked how a lot of the major plot lines brought up in previous books in the series were concluded, which felt really nice. I did not want to keep hearing about the same things again in the fifth book. So the fifth book is going to follow some different things, which I'm really excited about. And hopefully we can get some answers about Steven. I read a thriller this month, which I don't read a lot of. And I think thrillers are just not for me as much as mysteries are for me. But I read Home is Where the Bodies Are. I did an audiobook for this and I rated it a 3.75 star. I did really enjoy this. Even though talking about the plot does not sound like it would be fast paced, it felt really fast paced. It was a shorter book and I felt like things were constantly moving and you were wondering what was happening in the story. A mother passes away and the three children are like going through their belongings and trying to like maybe sell the house and they find some old VHS tapes. They watch a video and see someone dead on the video camera, which is wild. And they're trying to figure out what happened. They don't know any of the details. They'd never heard about this happening before. Like their parents hadn't talked to them about it. So they're trying to unearth what is going on. And then some evidence goes missing. There's some suspicion on like who's telling the truth and then you get a big reveal at the end. I felt like this was a little bit predictable. Like I was not surprised to hear who done it, <laughs> but I was a little bit curious to find out why or like how it all came about. So that was interesting. There were definitely some twists toward the end as we learn more about the characters. I think something I don't like about thrillers is they tend to be about crummy people doing crummy things. And this book was a little less so. The characters, even though I didn't really like them, felt very real and relatable, honestly. And so it wasn't totally out there for the most part. We definitely get like a sociopath involved, but for the most part, these characters were normal and human and flawed. Not my favorite, like I didn't love the characters, but they felt very realistic, which I appreciated. I didn't like, there was like a random shallow romance that was just like kind of sprinkled in where these two characters trauma bonded and that was a little weird. But other than that, I feel like the story as a whole was like well-rounded and was like all inclusive and was an interesting experience to read. And I definitely recommend it if you are interested by the premise. The next book I read was a physical book and this is Emily Henry's new book, Funny Story. Wee. Ah! Oh my gosh. <gasps> I was looking for that bookmark. Oh my gosh. I wanted to read this book for a while. I finally read it this month. This bookmark fell out of it when it fell. I've been looking for this bookmark for forever. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. Okay. <laughs> Emily Henry, funny story, her newest novel. I feel like on the spectrum of Emily Henry novels, this book is closer to Happy Place than it is to Beach Read, though it's not as Happy Place as Happy Place is. <laughs> if you've read Emily Henry, you know, but it was definitely more emotional. The premise of this book is that Daphne's fiance cheats on her with Miles's girlfriend. And so then the cheaters, break up with these two and get together. And these two end up roomating because Daphne needs a cheap place to live because she got kicked out of her house. Her ex-fiance's new fiance is his ex-girlfriend. Yes, it's confusing. It's hilarious also. So you walk into the story and they're both really depressed, honestly, from having this huge wrench thrown in their lives and they're living together and they don't even really get along. They're just kind of coexisting. But you see their relationship grow from just roommates to being friends to really caring about each other to being lovers. And I really loved seeing that progression of the relationship. I loved the humor involved. 
with these two and like seeing their characters grow. I really liked them together. It made me laugh out loud in a lot of ways, even with the mega sad undertone of it all. And I think that Emily Henry does an amazing job with her characters and also with chemistry between her characters. This was only a 4.5 star for me. I think the ending just like did not hit. I think it's because the third act conflict was miscommunication based and some of it was intentional. And even if it was for a good reason, it still like drove a big spike through the relationship. And it felt unsatisfying to see them kind of patch up what had splintered in their relationship. And it felt like their relationship at the end of the book was still kind of in a fragile spot because of how it had been splintered by some choices these characters made. And it wasn't, I guess it's not that big of a deal. It's miscommunication, it's not like cheating or anything, but it just felt kind of unsatisfying to see them stay together. And it felt like they hadn't fully resolved what had happened towards the end of this book. It was just like, you meant well, so that's okay. I wasn't feeling that as much, but I really loved this book overall. It's just like the ending was like not quite it for me. Okay, it's What Moves the Dead's turn. And I did a reel on my Instagram. I should probably post it here on YouTube. I forget that they have shorts. But I read What Moves the Dead by T. King Fisher, and I did an audiobook for this. It was only like a five hour listen compounded with, I listen at like 1.75 speed usually. And it was a really quick read. I read it in a day. And this is a horror novel inspired by The Fall of the House of Usher, which is a classic horror short story by Edgar Allan Poe. And I'd read that a few months ago, kind of preparing to read this book. And I feel like this book did a really good job at building on that classic, both in vibes as well as in like storyline and plot and building on it and adding more to the story, which I really appreciated. I wish there was more horror. This is very gothic and vibey and you don't really feel the horror for most of the story until things get really grotesque, which was awesome. I really like how Teen King Fisher ups the ante with their horror, but I wish there was a little bit more horror throughout this story and not just on the tail end of it, if that makes sense. But I'm really looking forward to reading the next book. I rated this a 4.25 star. What Feast the Night is the next book and I'm hoping to get to it soon. I'll probably do the audiobook again and I'll let you know what I think when I read it. The only like big thing that felt a little incongruous with this story, there's like a fantasy country that these characters are a part of and it was really interesting learning about the backstory of this country and the impact that war and military has had on their language. Specifically, the main character is non-binary, which is really cool, and learning about the military's impact on the commonality of like non-binary characters and the language that's used to refer to military versus non-binary people and kids and all that stuff. It was just very fascinating. I liked learning more about the character themselves, but it didn't feel like it had any bearing on the story. I think the discussion on war and language and non-binary, it was very interesting to learn about from a character perspective, but it felt irrelevant to the plot. And so considering how short this book was, it felt like it was taking up space that didn't need to be there. I would love for that component of the story to be brought into future books in the series and to make it more relevant. But for this book, it didn't feel very relevant, though it was very fascinating. And I really liked having that character depth. The next book I read is the start of my romance readathon. Well, technically, the end of this book was the start of my romance readathon. And it is Powerless by Lauren Roberts. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. And the very last few hours of my listening to this was the very start of my romance readathon that I mentioned at the beginning of this video that should be coming out maybe next week. And this is definitely a fantasy, but it had a very strong romance element. This is like The Hunger Games plus Divergent plus The Selection. So if you like those YAs, you're gonna love this book. It's a little bit long. That's really my only gripe. I rated this a 4.75 star, but it's also like really small type for a YA. And so it took a long time to read. Audiobook wise, it was over 17 hours. That's horrendous <laughs> for a first novel in a YA book. That was my only issue, but I really enjoyed this. I really like her writing style. It was easy to read, but also very descriptive and interesting to read as well. 
And I really like the premise that there are elites in this world that have magic powers and there are ordinaries that they've tried to kill off because apparently these ordinaries are going to make the elites sick. You follow Peyton, who is an ordinary hiding out, trying not to be discovered, and Kai, who is one of the princes, and see them interact through like random happenstance of running into each other and also having a competition type of scenario. And there's some political inklings thrown into it and seeing how she tries to navigate being in the spotlight and coming to know the princes while trying to hide her identity as an ordinary. So oof, what an ending. I'm really excited to read the next book. It's coming out really soon in July. So I'm so excited. I really have enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to reading more from Lauren Roberts. I think this is her debut, which is really exciting. I think she did a great job. It definitely feels like more of a new adult book. I didn't feel like the relationships were too immature, which I really appreciated. Another book for my romance readathon that I listened to was The Cheat Sheet. Ah, was the Cheat Sheet by Sarah Adams. I've read the When in Rome duology. The third book's coming out in, I think, January, which I'm really excited about. But this is a prior series that I hadn't gotten to yet. The Cheat Sheet is a sports romance, NFL player, professional ballerina that have been friends for a long time, like since growing up. And a few years ago, they reconnected in LA and they're best, best friends. Friends to lovers, there's some fake dating. That's the garbage truck. This is like a long time friends to lover scenario with some fake dating. There's a little bit of a sports romance thrown in there. You get to know some of his teammates, which I think are featured in later books in the series, like the rule book, which recently came out. They both love each other, but they won't even broach that topic, which is kind of infuriating. I rated this a 4.5 star because that aspect of friends to lovers really bothers me. But I found that this was really cute and a little bit cheesy and Brie especially was a hilarious character. She did some ridiculous things, but it was all very on brand for her, which was really fun to read about. And while I feel like the fake dating wasn't super flushed out, it was really fun to see their relationship and see how Nathan was trying to win her over so that she would feel more comfortable with them possibly getting together. So he came up with this cheat sheet from his friends, from his teammates that listed all sorts of things that he could do to try to woo her over. I also really liked how there were a lot of twists and turns at the end I wasn't expecting. So it was overall just a really Really fun read. The next book I read was a physical book and it was part of this romance readathon, but I don't have the copy because I've already lent it out to a friend. This is The Dead Guy Next Door by Lucy Score. I rated it a 4.5 star. I really had a great time. This is a combo like paranormal mystery plus a true romantic comedy, and it was so fun to read. It did not feel like it was. 460 pages like it was such a fast and enjoyable read there's a lot of whimsy and ridiculousness and lots of humor throughout and so there was lots of times where I just laughed out loud or didn't see anything coming Riley is a reluctant psychic <laughs> she has some psychic abilities but she's trying really hard not to listen to the voices in her head or to see these visions but she sees her neighbor get killed and she feels obligated to tell people about it, but no one believes her. And then he's killed. So now she's a number one suspect. There's also a private investigator, Nick, who is looking into the shady dealings of this neighbor and then the neighbor dies. And so he is curious to find out what is truly going on. So these two team up and they are the romance and they do some fake dating, fake fiance type of like a casual fake dating, fake fiance so that they can get into more places and like get more information about what's truly happening. And it's just really fun. And because of the psychic paranormal element, it helped me suspend my disbelief for the ridiculousness of how these characters interacted and the things that happened in the plot because it just, you, you just kind of roll with it because there's also psychics and like seeing visions and stuff, which is not something we talk about in our day-to-day -day life. So it was really, really fun. Definitely recommend. I already bought the next couple books in the series. I am looking forward to enjoying more with Riley and Nick solving some mysteries. The last book from my romance readathon oh, was not a win. 
This is Earl's Trip by Jenny Holiday. This was an audiobook, and this was marketed as the hungover style set in Regency era, and it just did not hit. I put it at a 3.25 star. This book felt like it was trying to be a cozy romance and was really slow and meandering and very character focused with like zero things happening for the plot and like zero things that the characters did. It was just talking and thinking. Whereas the very beginning was action packed, there was scandal, it was exciting, but that's really the only thing that brought these characters together in the first place in like physical proximity. And then they spent the rest of the book just kind of meandering, which was kind of hard and boring to read, honestly. And I did an audiobook, but I was bored. It felt a little long of a listen because of that. And even though this book had a lot of really interesting modern touches, which were refreshing, they talked about found family and feminism and vegetarianism, which was interesting. This book felt kind of heavy handed in modern day topics. And it also felt like the regency-ness of it was totally washed out because they did so much of this modern thinking and modern speech and like modern opinions about sexuality and things. So it just, I feel like if it was more subtle and more judicious in its use of the modern takes, then I would have liked it more. Also, one of my biggest gripes with this book is that there is something included on the back cover as part of like the major plot points that is introduced at 68% of the way through the book. There were like zero surprises on what was happening. So you had nothing to look forward to. And that plot point sounded really interesting, fascinating. And I really liked that part of the story and how that impacted the relationship dynamic in this friendship between the main characters. But it wasn't fully fleshed out because it was brought out so late into the story. I feel like that could have been introduced way earlier and kept things more interesting, seeing the characters evolve based on that plot point. Not a fan. Maybe I would read something else by Jenny Holiday. Maybe something more modern because I feel like it just did not scratch my Regency romance itch that I was looking for. The next book that I finished via audio was Bride by Ali Hazelwood. Yes, I read it. I read it. I rated it a, a four star, but I might drop it down to like a 3.75. I enjoyed it. It was a fun read. The background, the world building was really interesting between the vampires and the werewolves and the humans and the political dynamics between them that was touched on a little bit. It was just interesting. I've never read an Omegaverse type of book before and so I learned a lot. I did really enjoy these characters but I feel like they lacked a lot of depth and they didn't have a, much of a personality. Like they had a little bit, but I, yeah, I wanted just a lot more depth between Low and Misery. And what really dropped it down a notch for me was the third act conflict and how things were going great and seeing their relationship progress from like strangers to friends to lovers. There was just like this one horrible scene where one of the characters was really mean and was gaslighting the other person and was saying some really hurtful things. And then there's like a super dangerous scenario right after that as the other person's kidnapped. And so then the first person saves the day kind of, and it just felt like the conflict never got fully resolved. And it was like a really big deal. Like I have strong feelings about what happened <laughs> and not having that conflict adequately like looked at and resolved and just having the characters like have one quick chat and then like make up pretty quick was just not hitting for me. And that like instance of the character being mean and gaslighting the other was just very out of character too. It kind of felt contrived. This was a fun story. I enjoyed reading it, but I could definitely see how this is not like the best example of an Omegaverse type of book. And if you're into that kind of thing, I don't know if I'm gonna seek out any more books like that. The final book I finished in the month of May, I finished it at like 11.20 p.m. on May 31st on my night shift. This is Hannah Tate Beyond Repair by Laura Piper Lee. I'm glad I remembered because I just looked and I don't have it written down. <laughs> this is her debut. It's a romance that involves a new mother and her little baby and they're living with a boyfriend and Hannah finds an engagement ring like in his boot and thinks that he's gonna propose and he ends up breaking up with her because he says, I thought it was gonna work out, but I really wanna see other people 
but you can still live at my house and pay rent and watch the baby. And she's like, um, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to work. So she stands up for herself. She leaves him. She goes lives with her parents and tries to help set up their Airbnb type rental spot so that her parents can make some money in their retirement. And she's using her interior design dreams that she's had since she was little. And she works with the really attractive contractor that lives just down the road. And there's some amazing chemistry between these two, but he lives in like a tree house. He doesn't have a phone. He's very disconnected from the modern world. And so there's definitely some obstacles that these characters have to bridge in order to be together. I really loved the chemistry in the first half of this book. In the second half of this book though, it felt like the gap between these characters was not ever bridged in the second half of the book. And that would have been the time for them to like go through some character development and see things a different way, maybe try things differently, et cetera, et cetera. Some things resolved at the very end of the book, but it felt like it resolved so, so fast. Like it was a really big pivot and it would have been nice to see more of a gradual change throughout the book. And the ending of this book kind of just wrapped things up a little too nicely. And considering how like emotional and the deeper themes involved with raising a baby and navigating a new relationship and things like that, interacting with her parents and like navigating her own generational trauma, like all those deeper themes, I feel like it would have fit better with the book as a whole if the ending of the story wasn't quite so picture perfect. All right, that is all 18 books that I read in the month of May. I did a lot more reading than I anticipated and I think it's because I had a lot of really good books that I flew through and some other books that I wasn't a super fan of that I wanted to get done with quickly because I have a hard time DNFing books. I had honestly a pretty great reading month though already in the month of June I've had a really really bad reading month. 2.25 and 2.5 stars respectively for my first two reads of the month. Keep an eye out on my June wrap up video to see what horrible things I've been reading and putting myself through. And if you want to know the books that I'm hoping to read for the month of June, check out my TBR video that I have. I'll link it up above and down below. And let me know what things you're reading. And have you read any of these books that I read this month? It's a nice little spread some variety. I would love to hear what kind of books you're reading and loving so that I can hopefully add them to my TBR because it's not been a great June so far. I love to hear from you down below in the comments. So please share the things that you're reading and enjoying. And if you've read any of these books that I have talked about today and until next time, happy reading. Bye.